Well, hey, welcome this morning. My name is Marshall Walter. I'm the executive pastor here at Grace. And uh, it is just a joy uh, to take my turn this summer uh, along with our other elders and staff. Just so very thankful for uh, the summer change of pace and uh, just to stand with men who have done a great job faithfully preaching God's word. And uh, as the more we do church, the more that we're involved in church planting, the more I go to visit other places, uh, it's just such a hallmark of God-honoring churches when the Word of God is clearly taught, and uh, it's just been a privilege to sit under that this summer. And uh, I thank all of you for just your graciousness in all of this. I know this starts to wear thin. Um, there's been an increasing number of people asking, when is Jordan back? And it's fine. None of us take that personally. Um, it's probably it's part of some big secret plan Jordan has for job security. Um, to give up the pulpit some this summer, but uh, maybe more biblically, it's just true that sheep know their shepherd's voice. And uh, that's a good thing too. And so look forward to that. You get two weeks of me this week and next week. And then starting in August, Jordan will be back up week in and week out. Sermon manuscripts will be back to normal and uh, everybody can just relax a little bit, but you gotta grit, it, grit your teeth here a little bit and push through the next couple of weeks and then we'll, we'll settle in here. But uh, it's been fun this summer. We've been working through this series together on what healthy discipleship looks like. What are the marks of a follower of Christ? What things should distinguish us um, as believers? And I think really my task here the next couple of weeks is to, to start to pull some of these threads together for us, uh, to connect some of the dots that have been um, laid out in the past weeks. And, and really, as it boils down this morning, we're going to look at um, how we make decisions based on convictional priorities that we have. We've talked about this summer, right? If I'm wanting to pursue Christ, and I trust that's our intent here this morning. You don't typically take time on a Sunday morning to come to church unless that's your desire, right? I wanna pursue the Lord. I wanna grow in my relationship with him. I wanna be walking with the Lord, and yet I struggle through my sin. How do we, in the midst of the day-to-day -day of life, in the midst of all the things that are going on, of of pursuing the Lord, of dealing with sinfulness, of utilizing my giftedness, how do I make decisions that are gonna be honoring to him? How do I make decisions that are gonna set me up for success in the Christian life? What are those convictional priorities that we ought to have as a group of believers that, that anchor us in the midst of all the decisions that come at us? I thought it was interesting. There was a study done last year um, out of Leicester University in England by a woman named Eva Krakow that determined that the average human being makes 35,000 decisions a day. That's a million decisions a month. And I think the challenge so many times is that we are so wrapped up in the day-to-day, -day, the tyranny of the urgent, the chaos of the moment, the laundry list of things that I have to do that I'm just surviving, right? Forget thriving. I'm just trying to survive and get through life. And the danger is that we, we don't take the time to stop and think. We don't take the time to consider and to, to set before us a, a pathway, a direction, a set of priorities that allow us to make decisions in keeping with where we're after, where we're headed in life. What governs those 35,000 decisions you're going to make today? What's the, the underpinnings of biblical truth that allow you to think through all of those decisions that are coming one right after another? This past spring, I uh, had the opportunity to travel to Cleveland, Ohio. Can't say that was on my bucket list of places to go, um, but visited a church just outside of Cleveland. And while I was there, I snapped this photo I've asked the guys to put up. I will apologize, I'm not a great photographer. But it made me think, and I'll explain the photo here in a minute, but um, we're in the stage of parenting. We have a seven-year-old and a 10-year-old, and life is just going all the time. I thought life was busy when they were littler. I've heard life only gets busier from here. And so much of parenting is just managing the chaos. It's just a game of survival. We're just trying to hang on in any given moment, in any given day. They're never gonna to get to the point where they sleep through the night. I'm never gonna stop wiping their butt. They are never going to learn to be obedient. Will they ever listen to something that we say? 
I thought it's, it's a lot like life, right? Life is a lot the same way. In the grind of the day to day, in the grind of the moment, it's just one thing after the next. I'm, next. I'm never gonna get to the end of the list of the things I need to do. We're never gonna have enough money to do all the projects that we want to accomplish. This nagging pain or injury that I have is, is never gonna go away and these things start to just press in and consume and in the moments of life, it's difficult to see the big picture. And it's what stood out to me when I saw this. This was above the wall. They have a, a check-in area in their kids' ministry, not dissimilar from ours, iPads to check your kids in. And this was on the wall and it starts in the upper left there and it's picture frames with beads inside of them. And it starts from birth in the upper left and goes to the time your kids turn 18 in the bottom right. One bead for every week that your kids have before they are 18 and leave the house. And it just struck me, right? Just that little bit of perspective, the little bit of seeing the big picture in the grind of the moment of life. It's easy to lose perspective. It's hard to make good decisions about what should we be doing right now. But I've watched this play out with some of you here in the last couple of years. I've heard you say, hey, we only have one summer left before our kids leave the house. What do we need to teach them before they go? What do we need to do before they leave, right? The big picture gives us perspective. It makes deciding those things so much easier when we see where we're going and we see the larger uh, picture of what is going on in these things. It's what we want to try to unpack a little bit this morning. In the day-to-day, in the routine of the Christian life, in the midst of making a million decisions, it's hard to keep that big picture in perspective. It's hard to develop priorities as we're on the run. And so we want to take a moment today and just step back a little bit to try to look at a few different places in Scripture. At what are those biblical convictional priorities that needs to undergird all those decision, decisions that we're making in the day-to-day. I do not have a secret decision-making plan for you this morning. There is a million decision-making paradigms out there. You can go find them. You can talk to Randy Beatty. He and I have talked. He's got a bunch. But I want to step back and, and look at really what undergirds that because I think the challenging part for us is establishing those biblical priorities so that when the decision of the moment comes, we know how to think through the decision that we need to make. So we're going to hop around a little bit today. We have kind of a a bunch of passages that we're going to look at. And my hope is that we cover four priorities this morning. And the first one's easy because we're going to start in Genesis 1. So the very first chapter of your Bible, you can open up there and look at the end of the chapter. My hope's that we will get through all four. We have a lot of time this morning, um, but we'll punt till next week at the end if we have to. So we'll try to work through this here. But look at Genesis 1 with me. We're going to look at verses 27 and 28, and I would say our first priority today is that we must pursue God's glory. We must pursue God's glory. Look at what verse 27 says. It says, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created him. And God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Here we are, end of Genesis 1, the creation account has taken place. We're working through the six days of creation. God has created everything and he comes to the pinnacle of his creation and he creates mankind. And just just two things I want to pull out of these verses this morning. And the first one is this. You'll notice in verse 27, it says that we as mankind are created in the image of God. There are probably a small library worth of books that have been written about what it means that mankind's created in the image of God. But without getting into that this morning, what it embodies is that we as human beings have been created to be representatives of God in this world. That uniquely, different from every other living thing that God has created, we were created to represent God here, to image him into this world. In a variety of different ways, we have been left here for this purpose. And in fact, you'll see that play out in verse 28, because you'll notice there that it says we have a role to play. What is our job as human beings? It says there in verse 28 that we are to be fruitful 
and multiply to fill the earth and subdue it. We're meant to have children, lots of them, and we're meant to send them out. And humanity is designed to spread out throughout God's creation. Why? So that God is represented in every part of what he has created, so that the glory of God is proclaimed and displayed in every nook and cranny of creation. The answer to the meaning of life is not the number 42. It's Genesis 1, 27 and 28. This is what we were created for. This is why we exist, to glorify God in all things, in all places, that God may be made much of everywhere at all times. And yet we know, right, gospel reality here, that if we keep reading in Genesis, we're going to get to chapter 3 and Adam and Eve are going to fall into sin. And that ability to represent God in this world is broken. The relationship with God is destroyed. And so the rest of Scripture begins to unfold what is the glory of the gospel. That God found a way, that God made a way to restore that relationship, to restore our image of Him so that we could return to our created purpose of glorifying Him in our lives. Look at this as we uh, just kind of work through a couple of verses in the New Testament. When we get to Romans chapter 3, Paul says this. In Romans 3.23, you probably know it, right? For all have sinned and what? Fall short. Fail to attain to the glory of God. Fail to do what we were created to do because of our sin, because of our failure. And yet Christ, in coming to the cross and dying on the cross for our sins and living a perfect life and paying the debt that we owed, not only paid for that, but found a way to restore our relationship with God so we could return to living to a way that was glorifying to the Lord. It's what Jesus prays for in John 17. Right before he goes to the cross, Jesus is praying to the Father, and he says at the beginning of John 17, when Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven, and he said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you, since you have given him, given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. What was Christ trying to accomplish when he went to the cross? What was he trying to do? His aim was to glorify the Father in being obedient and submissive to what the Lord had called him to do so that we could be restored. So that we could return to glorifying the Lord, so that the Lord again would be glorified in all things. Through Christ, our relationship with God is restored. Through Christ, we can return to living as we were created, living as the Lord intended us to live. And Peter says this as well. If you flip near the end of your New Testament to 1 Peter 4, parallel passage to the one Steve preached uh, last week, Peter says in chapter 4, verses 10 and 11, as each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. You've been given a gift. You've been used, given it to serve one another. Therefore, whoever speaks, speak as the one who speaks the oracles of God. Whoever serves is the one who serves by the strength that God supplies. Why? In order that in everything, God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. In our restored state, as those who are part of the church, as we walk in this pathway of discipleship together, as we begin to utilize the giftedness the Lord has given to us in salvation, why do we do that? So that God, again, is glorified in all things. That is our purpose in life as human beings, is to glorify Him. It's one of the main convictional priorities that we need to have. And just as we, we talk about that practically, and we start to work through what does that look like, I got to ask the question, how is that true in your life? How is the priority of seeking to glorify God in all things coming out in your day-to-day decision-making? I'm faced with this choice. Are we asking the question, how do I glorify God best in this? Is this glorifying to God? Yes, then I should do it. If it's not, then I shouldn't. And the beauty of this is it's not, it's helpful even in the uh, non-yes or no questions, right? Because sometimes the answers aren't that simple. 
Should I do this thing? Is it glorifying to the Lord? Well, maybe. It kind of depends. And that's good because it allows us to start to think through, well, how do I glorify God in this thing? How do I wrestle through this freedom and this liberty that I have in Christ? I can do these things. It's not dishonoring to the Lord, but should I? Is it helpful for me to grow in that relationship with the Lord and honoring the Lord? How much of my time is being filled up with things that ultimately aren't clearly glorifying to the Lord, but are maybe worthless? A waste of time, a a poor use of time. A little bit of that is good. The Lord has given us this world to enjoy. We want to take advantage of that. But too much of that, and those things begin to push out the clear things that we should be doing to try to glorify the Lord in all things. Are we seeking to glorify God in the decisions that we're making? Is that a factor in our thinking as we face decisions? I think one of the most uh, helpful things that we've done in this is that we've just set some convictional priorities for us as a family. Just some things that the Walter family is committed to. That we've talked about, that we've worked through, that Becca and I have sat down and, and over 19 plus years of marriage now have said, this is just the way the Walter household is going to function. One of those things, just to give you a couple examples, we go to church on Sundays. I know that's a novel idea, right? For 15 years now, I've been a pastor here at the church. We were going to church here week in and week out before I was on pastoral staff because it's a conviction that we hold. I like what Rob Green says. Rob Green has a a premarital counseling book. He says when he meets with young couples, he encourages them to be at church 48 weeks a year. You get two weeks for being sick. You get two weeks to be out of town on vacation. You should be here the rest of the time. And I don't care about the number, right? Forget whatever number that ends up being. The point is, this is where we come on Sundays. This is what we do. Our Sunday mornings are booked. It's just just who we are. It's just what we've committed to, that we want to be part of the church body. Similarly, we have 35 to 40 Tuesday nights this next year that are already booked. Because we go to shepherding group on Tuesdays. It's just part of being the body here. It's part of what we're committed to. It's part of what we're, when other things come up on Tuesday nights, we say, hey, we're busy already. It's not an option. It's not a discussion. We've had this conversation about finances. We give first in our budget. And we talk about and we evaluate how can we sacrificially give this year? How can we give a a little more? Can we increase the percentage of our giving this year as opposed to last year? Are there ways that we can utilize our finances to to serve the Lord? We have to talk through these things. We have to wrestle through how do we honor the Lord in these different areas of life. And and I know that from experience. And and I just share, it was one of our our first couple of years of marriage. And my wife came home one day all excited um, because most of you know her, but if you don't, my wife is like the most disciplined person in this room. It's not even close. When she decides to do something, she just does it. One of the things that she decides to do is work out, and she does. Doesn't matter how busy the rest of the schedule is, she carves out time to do it and to do things like running, which I don't really understand fully. And we were a couple of years into marriage, and she came to me one day and she said, hey, there's a Disneyland half marathon It's decently expensive, it's Disney, but I'd like to do it. It's on a Sunday morning here in a couple of months. And I had that moment in my heart where I went, man, I don't really think that's what the pattern we wanna set as a family on Sunday morning, that we just miss church to do fun things. Not that there's anything wrong with that, you're gonna have to work through that decision But in my heart that morning, I knew, like, it's the wrong call. Early in marriage, this is the wrong precedent to set. And being the, um, you know, terrible leader that I am, I totally did not want to tell my wife she couldn't go for that reason. I said, ah, it's kind of a lot of money. I, I think we should not do that, right? And she just, she said, okay, right? She was submissive. She went along with it. It was great. And I thought, phew. And isn't the Lord good? Because sure enough, a couple weeks later, you know what happened? My wife came home. She had been talking to somebody at the gym. 
They were running the Disneyland Half Marathon. They had something come up. They weren't going to use their spot. She can have it for free. <coughs> and the Lord's kind, right? Because we have to have the real conversations in our marriages and in our lives and in our households. What are we going to do and why? What are we going to pursue? What priorities are we going to have as we seek to honor the Lord and to glorify him in all of the things that we're doing? And so it's got to be our first priority this morning. It has to be one of the main things that we pursue God's glory in all of the decisions that we make. Secondly, you can flip over to the book of James chapter 4. Not only do we want to pursue God's glory in all things, but we want to cultivate personal holiness. We want to cultivate personal holiness. Um, I have often found myself thinking of life in terms of the second seat, the second chair. Um, the Christian life is a life of submission. It's what it means to become a follower of Christ. I've given up my own way of living. I've given up my own set of values. I've given up my own pursuits, the right to feel like at least I'm in charge of who I am and what I'm doing. I have yielded to the Lord. For the last, uh, it's my 10th year now as executive pastor here at the church. Nobody knows what that means, and that's okay. Um, this is a good example. Life as an executive pastor is life in the second seat. I'm not in the first chair. That's Jordan. It's his job. And under Jordan's leadership and the direction of the elders, they have said, this is who we are as a church, and this is where we're going as a church. Their opinion about that is what matters. They're setting the tone and the direction and the rails for us to run on as a church. My job's the second chair. I have a ton of responsibility. I have a ton of authority. There's very few things that happen here that don't cross my desk at some point before they get executed. Downside is, you can blame me. If something's going wrong, I'll just take it right now. It's my fault. But all of that authority and all of that responsibility only extends as far as the covering that Jordan and the elders have given. It only extends as far as those rails that I've been given to run on. If I get outside of that and I just start trying to take us in a different direction, I'm failing to do my job. The Christian life is like that too. We have tons of freedom, tons of autonomy, tons of responsibility and areas of oversight and direction that we can give to things in this life, so long as it's submissive to who the Lord is and to what he's called us to do. We have delegated authority, delegated responsibility. We don't serve at our own pleasure. We serve at the pleasure of the one that we're working for in Christian life. It's a life of submission. I want you to see what James says about this in chapter four. I, I'd encourage you, this whole chapter is excellent. We're just gonna start in verse seven and look at a couple of verses here. He starts by saying in James 4, 7, submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will exalt you. There's two commands that are given in verse seven. Two things that James says to do. The first is that we would submit ourselves therefore to God. The word is a military term. It implies that God is the commanding officer and we are bringing ourselves under his authority. As our commanding officer, this is not an argument. It is not a debate. It is not a level playing field. Marching orders are being given. We are to carry them out. And part of that is to engage then in the spiritual battle that we are in for our sanctification, for the state of our souls. If we're going to draw near to the Lord, we need to resist his enemy, to resist his opponent. It's consistent in the New Testament, this idea that we see. Because we are called to serve the Lord. We are called to be submissive to his leading in our lives. And that's not easy. 
And I want you to notice, James gives us a, a pathway here. I just want us to see four aspects, four progressive steps that we can take. How do I learn to be submissive? How do I grow in being submissive? How do I become more and more holy as I pursue this? He says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. It was a command that was given to the uh, Levitical priests in the Old Testament. It was an expectation that as part of their daily life that they would have an, a more intimate relationship with the Lord, that they would spend time pursuing him, getting to know him, understanding who he is and how he functioned and operated. Submission to the Lord is going to involve an investment of time on our part to get to know the Lord, to understand his word, to grow in our knowledge and appreciation of who God is. And one of the interesting things that happens as we begin to pursue the Lord and see the Lord through his word and, and understand him is it begins to reveal things about us, which is what James says next. That as I begin to draw near to the Lord, as I begin to engage in this process of getting to know the Lord and resisting things that are of the enemy, that it reveals that I have a sin problem that needs to be addressed too. He goes on to say that we need to cleanse our hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. James is writing to believers. He's writing to people like us, and he's going, look, you may have been saved, you may understand the gospel, but we still struggle with this sin nature. We still have to be engaged in this regular process of being cleansed from our sin, of identifying the areas in our hearts and in our lives that are not brought into conformity to the Lord's will yet. As we work through that, or if we fail to work through that, it is to be double-minded, it is to be hypocritical that we claim to be pursuing the Lord, that we claim to be following him, that we claim to be seated in that second chair, and yet we're always fighting for control. And as those things are identified, James goes on to say that we need to repent of them. That's what he means when he says that we need to be wretched and mourn and weep that our laughter should be turned to mourning and our joy to gloom, that we ought to be wretched. It's the idea of being broken, that I need to see my sin and, and before the Lord, I gotta go, oh, that's wrong. It's not right. It's not who you have called me to be. That internally before the Lord, it, it just wrecks me. But it doesn't stop there. That, that internal wrecking before the Lord would manifest outwardly in mourning and weeping. There would be a desire to, to change. I, I, I think we all struggle in probably these different areas of things, right? There's times where we are just blind to our sinfulness. I just don't see it. But I think more than that for me, it's I do see it. We want to be real honest. We want to talk about who I really am. I know I'm a wreck. I know I'm a sinner. And I think this step is so critical for us in that process because it's not enough to just identify the areas where we are broken before the Lord. But we need to turn to the Lord. We need to cry out to the Lord. We need to, with mourning and grieving and weeping, plead with the Lord in saying, I can't fix this. I have tried. And I need you to help me. I need you to help me change. I need you to, to restore things that I can't restore on my own. I need you to do what it says in the rest of the verse, that you would turn the things that I have rejoiced in, the things that I find joy in, and that you would turn those to being things that I weep about, that I mourn about, that you would transform what I value and what I care about because I am a broken sinner that needs to be restored. As we work through this process of of drawing near to the Lord, he begins to reveal to us the areas of our life that need to be repented of. And as we begin to repent is where he gets to in verse 10, that it results in a godly humility. It allows us to humble ourselves before the Lord so that he can exalt us. Why? Because I've moved from thinking God and I are equal. Let me arbitrate this thing that he is calling me to do to saying, he is wholly unlike me. I am a sinner. I can't do it on my own. He is glorious and I am not. Let me submit to what he's called me to do. Let me humble myself and follow his lead. It's the process of sanctification, the process of growing in personal holiness that we would engage 
in our relationship with the Lord this way. It's one of the priorities that we need to have as a believer if we're going to be walking with the Lord. And so practically, I'd just ask, how are you drawing near to the Lord? Do you have time set aside to pursue an intimate relationship with the Lord? What does that look like? How are you doing that this year? Where is that on your to-do list of things to do on a regular basis? We need to be reading God's word regularly. It's not a time thing. The studies show it takes the average reader 12 minutes a day of reading scripture to read through your entire Bible in one year. You have 12 minutes. I'll go schedules with any of you. You can find, I can find 12 minutes. If you don't believe me, come, we'll look at your schedule together. I'll help you find the time. And if that's still overwhelming, look, aim small, miss small here. Right? A chapter a day of Proverbs. There's 31 chapters in the book. There's 31 days in most months. Just start reading a chapter a day. Pick a couple of Psalms and read a couple of Psalms in the day. Pick a short book. Philippians is four chapters long. Read the whole thing each day. Do that for a month and see where you're at. How are we seeking to draw near to the Lord? What does our time with him look like? We don't just need to draw near, but we need to address our sin as well. We've got to acknowledge who we are. Wherever you're at in that process of areas in your life, you need to humble yourself as we draw near to the Lord, as you allow the water of the word to wash over your heart. Are there areas of sin that you just need to acknowledge are areas of sin? Are there areas of sin where we need to cry out and say, Lord, help me. I need to be broken over this. I need to mourn and weep over this. I need to plead with you to help this change in my heart. A big part of that is that we would seek out godly counsel. Who are the people that really know you? That know you at a heart level, that know the things that you are struggling with? Maybe more importantly, who are the people that you'll listen to? the people that can say no to you and you'll heed their counsel. We need two, three, four, five people in our lives that know who we are, that understand our souls, that are Christians, followers of Christ, fellow disciples who would encourage us and challenge us to do the things that the Lord has called us to do. And we need to talk to them before we make all the decisions that matter in life, to seek their counsel, to seek their advice. We are fighting the battle for personal holiness. It is a battle for submission in our hearts and in our lives. We must submit to the Lord. We must pursue personal holiness in life. So as the decisions come, is this helping me be more holy? Is this helping me pursue the Lord in a greater way? Or is this allowing me to continue in a state of sin that I need to be rooting out? We must pursue God's glory together. We must cultivate personal holiness. And thirdly, this morning, we must establish a family foundation. You can look over at 1 Timothy chapter 3. 1 Timothy chapter 3 in the beginning of that chapter deals with biblical eldership and the qualifications for elders. We're going to look at a couple of these verses this morning, but I feel like I should uh, qualify this. Um, it is very true that uh, 2 Timothy, or 1 Timothy 3, sorry, um, 1 Timothy 3 identifies qualifications for elders and that these are non-negotiable. Um, as we talk about eldership at this church, these are the qualities that an elder must have in order to serve in the office of elder. However, Paul's point in articulating this to Timothy is not just to give a list of qualifications, it's to explain to him a, uh, or give him an example of what spiritual maturity looks like. It's what we're all to aspire to. Whether you're going to hold the office of elder here at this church or not, we are all called to mature spiritually and to be spiritually mature. And so principally then, we want to look at this and understand a couple of the principles that are being articulated here. And really, I will, I'll read verses 2 to 5, but we're going to focus on verses 4 and 5. 1 Timothy 3, verse 2 says, Therefore, an overseer, an elder, must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not a drunkard, not violent, but gentle, 
not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. And we'll focus here where he says, he must manage his household well, with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? I want to just look at this um, phrase he says here in verse 4, that he must manage his household well. One of the marks of spiritual maturity is a well-managed household. And I want to ask the question, I want to ask the question of the verses. Why does he say that? There's a reason given why that's a qualification and an expectation of spiritual maturity. And the answer is in verse 5. He must manage his household well, verse 4, with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. Why? For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? So observe the biblical principle that's being established here in this passage. Qualification for leading and ministering and caring for people in the church of God is the home. It's the foundation for ministry in the church. But I also want you to see as part of that the role that the family plays within the big picture of what God is doing. The role of the family is preparation for ministry in the church. A well-ordered home is preparation for the ability to be freed up to serve and minister and to care for others in the church. Family is the prereq. It's the foundation. It's the starting point. It's the baseline. It's regular season games. They matter. It's incredibly important that we would do the job in our homes that we're called to do in our homes. But nobody wins a championship in the regular season. Championships are run in the playoffs. Nobody wins a championship by managing their household well. You manage your household well so that you can be freed up to do ministry here in the body of Christ, in the family of God. This is where championships are won. And it's so easy, I think particularly in suburban America, places like Simi Valley, that family can be the trump card in everything. And it's massively important. But it's just the prereq. It's just the start. It's just the, the qualifying for what the Lord has really designed us to do. We want to be prepared. We want to be equipped. We want to be ready to minister here to the body of Christ. And we establish our credibility to do that in our own households. So look with me at verse 4. And look at how he uh, articulates this and what Paul is saying here to Timothy. That he must manage his household well. Household here refers to both the relational parts of your household, but also the operational parts of your household. Certainly the relational is a focus, right? We know that because of the rest of the context. This is a, um, articulating what an elder is to be. How is an elder prepared to care and to shepherd for the flock of God? That he has cared and shepherded his family first. Spiritual maturity, spiritual leadership is demonstrated in clearly leading in a direction of knowing where the Lord has called us to go, of being able to explain why the Lord has called us to go there and in caring for the people that have been entrusted to our charge. We must manage the relational side of things. It's the starting ground. And the Lord has given us specific roles to play within the family. I, I would encourage you if you missed it or if it's just been a couple of weeks now, Adam did an excellent job a few weeks ago walking through what family is supposed to look like in the life of a disciple. And so I'm not going to go back and reiterate all of that. I would just encourage you to go back and to review um, what he preached and how he laid that out for us. Other than I would say, we have to be aware of this. We have to be mindful of this. We have to work hard to establish this priority of family. We are in the midst of a culture that is doing everything it can to tear down the building blocks of family. And it's not just that marriage is being questioned. It's not just that parenting is being questioned. It's that the foundational unit of this church is being undermined because it's strong churches 
or strong families that lay the foundation for strong churches. There's a war going on in our culture to tear down the church through the unit of the family. And so husbands, we have to love our wives. Wives, we have to submit to our husbands. Parents, we have to train and teach our kids to be obedient. Children, we've got to honor and obey our parents. Singles, you don't get off the hook either. You got a household of one, praise the Lord. You get to skip out on all the drama that goes with the rest of it and just be freed up to serve the Lord in the church which you've been designed. We've got to play our role, which means the starting point is we've got to get our households in order. The home's got to get squared away. But beyond just the relational, this also speaks to the operational sides of the household too. How are you managing your family's time? What's the schedule look like? Are you overcommitted? Are we doing too many things? Are we racing from one thing to the next with no time for ministry? Or is that being carved out in the schedule of our week and the priority of our home that we're gonna be freed up for that? We're gonna leave a margin of time so that when people call to say, hey, I need help, we can respond to do those things. How are your finances? Are you living within your means? Are you saving for the future to be prepared for what the Lord brings next? Are you committed to sacrificially giving to be a part of what the Lord's doing through his church? Are you working hard in the first place to have financial resources to be able to do the things the Lord has called us to do? How are we doing in caring for our things? Is your home in order? Is it clean? Are things being maintained and taken care of? Are you using what the Lord has given you to show hospitality and to meet the needs of others? Is the household being maintained? Is it being run well? Is it being managed in a way that would be pleasing to the Lord? And you go, man, that's, that's a lot. And it is a lot. But it doesn't just say that it's to be managed. It says it's to be managed well. Man, it would be nice if you hadn't stuck that word in there. The word well means good. Well, I should say the common Greek word for well just means good. Well, morally appropriate, morally right. We would look at something and say, hey, that's good. But that's not the word that Paul uses here. He uses a different word that means well, it means good. But beyond what is good, beyond what is morally acceptable, it means that which is aesthetically pleasing. The implication being that besides beyond just checking all the boxes of having managed our households, we're to do that in a way that is appealing to others. We're to do that in a way where everybody else would go, hey, they've got it together. I want a home that's structured like their home. I want a marriage that's like yours. I want kids that are being trained like you're training your kids. I want uh, to be in the financial situation you guys are in. It's aesthetically appealing. It's pleasing. The home is to be managed well. That's the aim. That we would have homes that are in order. That we would have homes that are being managed in a way that is clearly in line with what God has called us to do. That is not chaotic. That is not out of control. But is seeking to glorify God in all aspects of the home. So that we can be diligent about the work of ministering here in the church. Because that's what it's preparing us to do. That's what it's qualifying us to do. And so I think the applicational question is just simply, how's your home life? What's your home like right now? Are your relationships in order? Or is there work to be done there? Are your finances in order? Or are there hard decisions that need to be made? Are things disheveled? Are they in a constant state of disarray? Are we scrambling from one activity to the next, to the next, to the next? We have a responsibility to establish a healthy family foundation, not as a destination, not as an end, not so we can pat ourselves on the back, not so we can just relax doing fun family things. As the prerequisite, so that we're able to engage here in a way that is effective and honoring to the Lord where we can help others 
move with us in that direction. It's not advanced work, it's basic work. Family prepares us, qualifies us for the job of ministry here at Grace See Me. Parents, are your kids watching you model this? Are your kids seeing, hey, mom and dad prioritize life in the local church? Are you looking for ways to serve and minister as a family, ways to serve and minister as a couple? Are you being hospitable? Are you investing in other people and other relationships and other families so that they could come to know the Lord or so that they could grow in their relationship with the Lord? What are our priorities? What are we committed to? Is the development of family, is preparation for ministry in the church one of those convictional priorities that we hold? It should be. We want to pursue God's glory in all things. We want to cultivate personal holiness. We want to establish a family foundation. And lastly, this morning, we want to be engaged in gospel ministry. Flip over to Ephesians chapter 4, and we will just walk through a little bit longer section together here fairly quickly. One of my uh, favorite passages, um, Ephesians 4 starts... Um, or we will pick up in verse 11, where Paul, talking to uh, the church at Ephesus, says that he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers. Um, if your Bible says and there, that's great. And functions like a hyphen. It's, one, it's not an additional thing. Shepherds, teachers is one term. It speaks to the office of pastor or the office of elder. And the job of that group is to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ. I don't want to get too bogged down in all of this, but I want to ask a simple question that we should all know the answer to. What's the pastor's job? Is it the pastor's job to go and do the work of ministry? No, it's our job as pastors to equip the saints to go and do the work of ministry. It's your job. It's our job as a church body to minister, to engage in relationships with one another and to do the gospel work of transferring the gospel into another's life through evangelism and through discipleship and through helping them grow in their relationship with the Lord. That's why it's the fourth convictional priority. We have to be engaged in this process. It's what Christians do. And he goes on in verse 13 to talk about just how this process plays out, right? Right? That we do this, that we equip the saints for the work of ministry so that the body of Christ is built up, verse 12 and verse 13, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. We are in this process of spiritual maturity, of growing in Christ, of being united around our faith and increasing in, in our knowledge and understanding of the truth of who God is. We are being knit together in these things. Maturity begins to happen as we been, begin to grow in our understanding of the Lord and our understanding of the gospel and our understanding of the faith that unites us all. It's why unity is connected with it because when we begin to focus on God and who he is and what he's doing, it begins to strip away our preferences, our perspectives, our opinions, all the other junk that clouds up what the word of God says. And we increasingly grow together because we're increasingly united around what the word of God has called us to do to the point that he says at the end of verse 13, that we reach mature manhood to the measure of the stature of fullness of Christ, that we grow up spiritually, that we're not like children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, right? You can picture the kid just getting rolled in the waves of the object sitting on the water, just getting pushed wherever the, the wind comes along, that as challenges come up, as decision points are reached, as new ideas come to us, as false teaching tries to creep its way in, that we're anchored, that we're stable, that we're united in the gospel and the knowledge of who Christ is and the things that he has called us and who he has made us to be, that we're not being moved all over the map. We've reached spiritual maturity. We're not swayed by every new idea that comes along. We're not flustered when people are being stupid in the culture around us. Because we know who we are. We know who our Savior is. We know what we believe and we know where it's all going. We see the big picture in things. 
And the fascinating thing that Paul identifies here in Ephesians 4 is that as we begin to do this as individuals, as we begin to pursue the Lord, as we begin to mature, as you begin to mature and you begin to mature and you begin to mature, that it begins to unite us together. And there is this centrifugal force that begins to happen within the church. Because look what he says in verse 15. Rather than being pushed all around the map like kids, as adults then, we speak the truth in love. And we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. That as we all individually grow and mature, we begin to take the step to speak the truth to one another in a loving way. Because I care for you, I'm going to say the hard things to you. We're going to have the hard conversations. We're going to pursue Christ together. We're going to die to self. We're going to seek after the Lord. And the church body begins to grow together with every part doing as it should and growing towards maturity together. The, the church body matures. And so the questions are, are we being equipped? Look, it's our responsibility. There's no blame shifting here. But it's your job. It's your job to be equipped. It's your job to be prepared. It's your job to take advantage of the opportunities that you have to grow in your relationship with the Lord so that the thing that's holding you back and ministering amongst the church is not that you don't feel competent. Not that you don't know God's word. Not that you're not prepared. Not that you're not learning on your own and have something to pass along to somebody else. It's our job to get ourselves ready, to be equipped, to have an understanding of God's word and the gospel that we can pass along. You don't have to know it all. None of us do. But you've got to know something. You've got to be prepared. Spiritual maturity comes from knowledge. It comes from understanding of who God is and what he has done for us in Christ. We've got to be growing. And if you're growing, then you need somebody to disciple. You need somebody to pass it along to you're only responsible to pass along what you know. Learn something and share it. Find somebody to walk through life with. Maturity comes as we begin to speak the truth in love towards one another. It does no good if you know all the truth or love all the people. If you don't put those things together and you don't apply them in a specific person's life, we're not going to grow as a church body the way that we're called and designed to. Making disciples takes time. It takes effort. It takes energy. It takes a home life that is not chaotic. It takes an understanding of who God is and pursuing him in all things. It takes a, a willingness to personally work through your issues so you're not passing those along to the person that you're discipling. And it takes an investment to push through the awkward, to push through the uncomfortable, to sit with somebody, to listen, to sit with somebody and call them to the things that we should be pursuing in life, to speak the truth, especially when it's difficult. Are you engaged in the work of ministry here in the local church? Is that what we're pursuing? Is that what we're after? Are we ordering and structuring life in a way that allows us to make God-honoring decisions in the moment because our underlying priorities have been set? We need to pursue God's glory in all things. We need to cultivate personal holiness in our life. We need to establish the family foundation so that we're freed up to engage in gospel ministry here in the church. It's what the Lord has called us to do. And if we're doing those things, the answers to what decision should I make in this moment becomes really simple. All right, let me pray for us and we're gonna sing again here as we wrap up this morning. Father, you are good. And it is a glorious thing to uh, rejoice together, to celebrate together, to cry out to you together. For without you, we are nothing. And Lord, I know the uh, tall task these things are. I think it's right and appropriate that these things should feel overwhelming. Because Lord, it's impossible to do these things in our own strength. It's impossible for us to do these things apart from you. And so Lord, we cry out for your mercy. We cry out for your grace. We cry out for your provision, that we would be diligent to pursue you each and every day, that we would walk in the spirit, 
as we seek to make these decisions that you might uh, pave the way before us. As we are faithful on our end, Lord, we know that you will be faithful on your end to set up life in a way that is honoring and pleasing to you because, Lord, that is our desire. And so I pray that you would give us uh, just the discernment to know uh, where we should engage and where we shouldn't, to know the decisions that we need to make nearly every moment of the day. You would give us um, the willingness um, to have the hard conversations, to make the difficult decisions, to cut out the things that will hurt in order to live in the way that you have called us to do, that you might be honored and glorified in all things. In your son's name we pray, amen.